this. Come experience Jesus with us. Happy to see you this morning. Happy to worship Jesus together. So I'm going to ask you to stand with us as we begin with some musical worship.
Good morning, Rock Hill. How are we doing today? Happy Sunday. Nice. It's really good to see people in the front row. This is amazing. Uh, I, I just want to say welcome. I'm glad that we get to come together this Sunday morning and worship the Lord together. It's always an incredible time. And as I welcome you that are here right now, I just want to take a second and welcome those that are watching with us online. So at the count of three, we're going to turn around to the wall-mounted cameras back there, and we're going to say good morning. Ready? One, two, three. Good morning. Awesome. Well, as we welcome you, I just want to um, specially welcome those that are new with us who may be checking out our church for the first time. I just want to say we're so glad you're here, and we would love to know how we can serve you and how we can pray for you. And one of the main ways that we can do that for you is if you would fill out a Connect card that's on the bulletin. You can tear that thing off, fill that out, and you can put that in the offering. Or if it's easier, you can scan the QR code on the seat in front of you with your phone, and there you go. All the options are available right on the screen, and you can get connected that way. And the staff, we get together every Monday and we just pray for you guys. We would love to know how we can serve and welcome you here. So something shocking is happening today. We are finishing our series, Rock Hill Reset. If you need some tissues, in the back, right? Because it's been amazing. But we're finishing and Pastor Mike, who had a baby two weeks ago, incredible. Yeah. Let's go. So... Pastor Mike's going to be preaching on our identity. We've been going through our core identities, and today he's going to talk about our identity as learners. And as we just kick off our service and talk about what it means to be a learner, I want to just start us off by reading Proverbs 1, 7. This is just a great verse that talks about um, knowledge and wisdom. So I'm going to read this, and then we'll pray together. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Lord, as we start off our Sunday morning, God, we want to start by first just focusing on your holiness, on your perfection, your power, your grace, and your love. Lord, when we talk about learning and talk about growing, God, would you help our focus be on knowing you, on learning so that we can be closer to you, Lord, would you help our learning be from love and not just from a desire to be better or smarter than others, but to know you closer. God, would you teach us? Um, would you grow us today? God, I pray for Mike. that you give him energy, Lord? Thank you that he is, he is a father of little baby Julian. And God, I just pray that you would speak through him and in him today and speak through, to all of us as we hear your word. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart, and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone, from the first to the last, hath won my affections and bound my soul fast. Without to utter despair but through thy free goodness my spirit's revived and he that first made me still keeps me you this morning for your mercy completely undeserved for anything we have done but simply given because you are a loving father God we praise you that you have created us and that your end goal has always been to dwell among your people and God as we've seen throughout scripture how you have always pursued your people and made a way to dwell with them God we thank you now that through the work of Christ and now through the empowerment of the Spirit that you dwell within us. God, we thank you that when we are gathered as a people, you are here. God, may we be people who are changed by knowing that the presence of God is with us. God, I pray that as Mike preaches, that would be evident that you are speaking through him. God, I pray as we listen, that it would be evident that it is your Spirit that is changing and conforming us to the image of Christ for our good and for your glory. God, may all that we do this morning bring honor to your name. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. What am I? One of my favorite things about church is uh, uh, microphones that go haywire. No. Um, one of my favorite things about gathering with the church is just thinking about we're just taking our turn. See, as the world spins and the sun rises on all of these different time zones, there are people in every one of them that stand and they give glory to God. They sing his praises and they gather together and, and we just get to take part. We just get to take our turn because God's church is a global church. And how cool is it to think that there have, there have been churches already in uh, Johannesburg and 
uh, Cairo and Tokyo and Ho Chi Minh City and all over the world that have gathered and sung the praises of Jesus Christ because he's worthy. I want to invite Bill and Cindy Walsh up along with Laura Kesselhone, our global deacon, and they're going to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, an upcoming trip that they have. So Bill works for Crossway Publishing, um, and Bill, I just wanted to, would you just share with us real briefly, this one, uh, the battery's dead, so we're going to have to share. We'll be nice about it, okay? Just share with us what, what you're going to be doing over the next few weeks. Yeah, so I work for Crossway Publishers. Uh, if you use an ESV Bible, that's, that's us. Um, I've been involved for about 15 years now in a ministry that revolves around pastors in what we call the Global South. So if you've never heard of that, that's like Asia, South Africa, or South America, and Africa. And actually, that's where most Christians live. If you look at demographics, uh, most Christians are in the Global South. But the challenge is that there are literally millions of pastors and church leaders who don't have access to good training or good resources, and so they struggle to lead their churches. So that's the mission that I've been on uh, for some time now. Nowadays we say resourcing the church to the ends of the earth. So we're going to uh, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, and South Africa for three weeks, and we're gonna be visiting publishers, printers, translators, book distributors, Bible distributors, uh, people that we've partnered with over the years. And we're particularly going to focus on a book by a Zambian pastor, and we're working on a massive project to translate that into five languages and along with English distribute like 100,000 copies across the continent of Africa. So that's going to be a lot of the focus of our discussion. And so pray, pray that uh, we'll be protected from COVID while we're there, because if that happens, our trip will stop and we will probably wait it out and then come home. <laughs> so pray for that, but also pray for ministry relationships. That's such a key, and it, it's what everything revolves around is those working relationships and partnerships. Awesome. That's exciting. Hey, we're going to pray over you guys. Laura, I'm going to ask you to start, and then I'll close it. Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful for these two and bringing them to our body. And Lord, we're so thankful for the work that they do. And for Cindy being able to go with Bill, Lord, what a blessing to go as a couple. And Lord, I think of the verse of the day this morning was, be strong and courageous. For I go with you wherever you go. And so, Lord, we trust that you are going even before them, that you are making a way for these conversations and for their health and for the travel and for all of the things that will come their way. Lord, we trust you, and we ask that you make a way. Jesus, I ask that you would bless them and anoint them for the work right now. As they go, they go with our hearts. And so I pray, Father, that you would prompt the people sitting in this room over the next three and four weeks to pray for them specifically. God, wake us up in the middle of the night if you need to so that we can intercede for the work that is being done. God, we pray that you would bless the work of this translation and distribution and that 100,000 pastors would be better equipped to preach the word of God and to shepherd their churches uh, to thriving and flourishing. God, you love Africans as you love North Americans, as you love Asians and everyone around the globe. And so, God, would you use Bill and Cindy uh, for work that just multiplies generations? We ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You bet. Well, I invited Laura up uh, because I want you to know the face of someone to talk to if God has laid on your heart uh, global purposes, other people's. Uh, as a church, we want to be about sending and resourcing and mobilizing people that feel called to the nations. And so if you're intrigued at all about that, talk to Laura, and she would love to get you connected to some good resources or people that can help in that. Uh, one other thing before we go to fellowship break, uh, Crossway is an amazing publisher, um, and there was a book put out last year by Dane Ortland called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers, uh, and, and a donor came to Crossway and basically said, I want to get this book in as many hands as possible, and so partner... Uh, Crossway partnered with them and the author and essentially gave the, the book away to churches if they would facilitate some, some book discussions. And so we actually have 100 copies of this. If you would like one this morning, it's, it's our gift to you. It's Crossway's gift to you. Um, and it, it essentially talks about the heart of Jesus toward those who struggle with sin. 
Uh, many of us, when we think about Jesus, think of him as harsh and demanding, and often that is the furthest thing from the truth. Um, and so I'm going to be in the back room during fellowship break and also at the end of the service. If you're interested in a copy, come and grab one. No strings attached. But we will also have a book discussion led by France uh, on November 14th. So about a month away, it'll be a Sunday night. No expectation or obligation if you take the book, but just a, a group of people that are going to come together and talk about what we read. That, that often kind of cements the learning. So uh, once you take a minute right now to uh, greet one another, maybe meet somebody new, there's going to be coffee in the back, and then when Mike comes up, uh, it'll be time to dive into the Word together. All right, you guys can head on back to your seats. <laughs> hey, good morning, guys. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And, and like Josh said earlier, uh, my son Julian was born uh, two weeks ago. So uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> So that means two things. Uh, it means my heart is very full, so if I spontaneously weep, you know, there, that's, that's it. Uh, the second thing is that I haven't slept in about three years. So, you know, if I, if I accidentally start preaching heresy, I'm going to rely on the elders to just tackle me and intervene or something. No. So like Josh said, this is the last week in our series called Reset, Discipleship in the New Normal. And the purpose of this series was to look at our six core identities, kind of the summary of what it means to be a disciple, and then to look at what, what does that look like in our current time and place, you know, the, t the twin ports in the fall of 2021. What does it look like right now to live as worshipers, family, servants, witnesses, prayers, and then this morning, we're going to be talking about what it looks like to live as learners. So let me pray for the Lord to be at work, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you for meeting us in our weakness. Would you meet me in, in my weakness right now? But for all of us, as we open your word, we pray that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts so that we can see what you have for us this morning. In the good name of Jesus, amen. So you may have seen uh, this old commercial uh, for Old El Paso Tacos. Uh, it's become kind of an internet meme uh, in which a family is fighting about whether to have hard shell tacos or soft shell tacos, you know, the age old debate. I'm a soft shell guy myself. Um, so in the commercial, uh, you know, this debate's going back and forth and a little girl pipes up and she says, por que no los dos? Why not both? And and I actually really like that question. I think about that question a lot because it's a great approach to life in general. So many things in life are not either or choices, right? So much of what it means to be mature is the ability to hold two things in tension and in balance with one another. Por qué no los dos? Why not both? So before we get into what it means for a Christian to be a learner, let me just speak more broadly to one of the, the biggest tensions that you and I feel, uh, all of us feel, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not. It's just part of the sort of cultural air that we breathe right now. Every day we are told two opposite messages. So on the one hand, we are told to be ourselves at all costs. You do you, girl. You know, haters going to hate. Be true to yourself. Don't let any, anybody tell you to change, right? 
Be yourself. On the other hand, you're told to improve yourself. You've got to change. You've got to get out there and take charge of your life. You got to hustle, you know? Be a better you. And so we feel the push and pull of these opposite almost mantras, and it can really mess us up, right? It can even become core beliefs in us. Some of you believe that you'll never be enough, right? You've been told from your childhood or you've told yourself that you, who you are is fundamentally flawed, and so there's no hope that you could ever change. You just feel stuck. Others of you believe that you need to remake yourself constantly, Right? You, are, you are always pushing and striving and reaching for the next thing to bring some small measure of fulfillment, and you're just exhausted from that. And so either we don't need to change who we are, or we always need to change who we are. Do we just have to choose between these two terrible options, or, or is there a better way? Is there a por qué no los dos? The better way is that the good news of Christianity, the gospel, is this. Because of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, our identity is not found in who we are right now or who we will be after lots of effort. Our identity is found in the finished and transformative work of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So only the gospel can bring us both security in our present and direction for our future. Only the gospel can bring you both affirmation and transformation at the same time. And and even for Christians, so many of the problems in our faith stem from the imbalance. When, When we either strain to earn God's favor, or we just kind of sit back passively and we never grow. A mature Christian, though, is balanced. You're learning both to trust in the gospel and you're learning how to produce good fruit in your life. A mature believer is content with who they are in Christ and they want to become more like Christ at the same time. Here's the definition, I think I have it up on the screen, of a learner. This is our learner core identity. Our goal is for every disciple of Jesus to embrace a life of continual growth and learning. Christians should never stop learning and growing. We will spend the rest of our lives becoming who we are in Christ through resting in the gospel and striving toward godliness. Our lives are characterized by a humble confidence as we seek to continually become who we are in Christ. That's a lot of words, so I just boiled it down for you. This will be the big idea of the message, so if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The big idea is that Christians are lifelong learners who continually rest in the gospel and continually grow in godliness. So we're going to take those one at a time and unpack them, and for each one, we're going to have a different passage. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one kind of in the seat in front of you, or it'll also be up on the screen. And that Bible on the seat in front of you, you can just take that. If you don't have a Bible, that's our gift to you. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. This is Christians are lifelong learners who continually rest in the gospel. So the first part of that big idea. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you've been coming to Rock Hill for a little while, we just preached on this beautiful passage what was it, like six weeks ago? And as Kyle said, we're also giving away copies of Dane Ortland's book on these verses. But I, I want us to observe a different angle on it. Jesus in these verses is, is inviting anyone and everyone to take a hold of the rest that he's offering. It, it's an invitation for all of us pilgrims and exiles who feel that funny feeling of existential weariness, right? That that inner exhaustion. There's a famous prayer by St. Augustine that he said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, God. And some of you feel that this morning, whether you're a Christian or not. My soul 
needs rest. I'm feeling right now that my body needs rest, but it's a different thing. My soul needs rest. It's restless. But here's what's interesting. How does Jesus say that our souls will find rest? Did you notice it? Jesus doesn't say the way to find soul rest is to come to me and then just lie down and sleep. He says, come to me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's our key word, learn. The Greek word for learn is related to the word disciple. So to be a disciple literally means to be a learner, to be a student, to be a pupil. So the way that we will find rest for our souls is by learning from Jesus. What are we supposed to learn from him? We're meant to learn that he is gentle and lowly. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. In other words, we're meant to learn the very heart and purpose of this man who claimed to be God. So all Christians uh, get their PhD in Jesus studies, right? right? We study his character. We study his actions. And when we spend some time studying Jesus, reading about him in the Bible, what we will find is that he had a mission. And his mission was to reconcile sinful people to a holy God and to make all things new. And he did that by living the perfect life that we should have lived, by dying the just death that we deserve, and then rising again to give new life to anyone who hears this invitation, including you. Anyone who hears this invitation and comes to him can find that new life and rest. And in particular, the cross cross of Christ where he died for our sins is the only place where you will find peace with God and therefore peace with yourself. Why? Because on the cross we see Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, declare it is finished. In this world, you will be told to do, do, do more. And there is only one person who is going to tell you if you want your soul to have rest, You don't need to do. It is done. It is done. It is done for you. So church family, we need to learn again. If you've been a Christian for a day, if you've been a Christian all your life, we need to learn again how freeing it is to have our souls at rest. When you believe that Jesus has paid the price for all your sins, past, future, and right at this very moment, you don't have to perform for God. Take a deep breath. You don't have to earn anything. You don't need to achieve, succeed, win, accomplish to be enough. All you need to have a soul at rest is to come to Jesus and say, you are enough. Some of our pastors here preach at the chapel at Teen Challenge. Um, and it was, I had my first opportunity to do it last month. If, if you don't know, Teen Challenge is an addiction treatment and recovery center. It's over on 2nd Street. And one of my observations about preaching there is that people who have had to wrestle deeply with their addictions, with all the other struggles that surround that, people who have had to work through all those flaws and failures and sins, they are much more passionate about the grace of God than most Christians I know. Why? Because they know they need it. Jesus, I'm not enough in myself. I need you. And in the church, we sometimes have this terrible phrase, you know, put on your Sunday best, right? But for the Christian, our our Sunday best is nothing but the robes of righteousness that Jesus gives to us, right? The church should look more like a recovery group than a country club, right? So when I get up here, even as a preacher, and say, hi, my name is Mike, and, you know, we're part of a recovery group, so you say, hi, Matt, there you go. My name is Mike, and I'm a sinner saved by grace. And as Kyle often says, when we take communion, that's what we're doing. We're saying, I'm a sinner saved by grace. So what does this have to do with learning? So remember, Jesus says that in order to find rest in this world, we must learn from him, learn from his gospel. And even if we've been disciples or learners of Jesus for a long time, as my older brothers and sisters in the faith can tell you, if you've been a Christian for a while, it doesn't matter. You've still got more to learn. You can still go deeper into this. So how can we learn how to rest in the gospel. I have three things, and I'm taking my cue from the words that we say at the end of every service 
uh, declare, display, and delight in the gospel. So, here we go. First, we learn to rest in the gospel by declaring the cross. The atoning work of Jesus, his, his shed blood and broken body to take away your sins and give you his righteousness, this is the only right foundation to grow and improve and learn. Right? So think of it this way. When you were at school or when you were being taught by your parents, which was the better learning environment? An environment where you had the safety of being loved and accepted even when you failed? Or an environment where you had to perform perfectly in order to be accepted? We learn so much better when we're in a place where God has already accepted us. And then from there, we can grow and improve. The cross is the only place where we can be both humble enough to admit we're wrong and secure enough in the love of God that we can admit, yeah, I have room to grow. And then like the Samaritan woman in John 4, we can just declare to one another in the world openly, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did, right? I don't have to hide because all my dirty secrets and shame have been washed away by the sacrifice of Jesus. Our boast, our, our declaration is in the cross of Christ. Second, we learn how to rest in the gospel by displaying vulnerability. Now, let me clarify something here. So Christian vulnerability does not mean oversharing, right? Every person in this room should not know everything about you. But what vulnerability means is that the people who think that they know you best should actually know you, warts and all, mistakes and all, shameful past and all. The people who think that they know you best should actually know you. And everyone who calls this church home should have a place where they don't have to hide. And might I suggest that this is exactly what city groups are meant to be for. Um, specifically, our city groups do something called DNA groups, which are smaller, same-gender gatherings within your city group uh, that meet regularly to just share honestly about everything. What we're doing when we display vulnerability to each other is that we are just reminding ourselves over and over again that we are nothing more than redeemed sinners saved by grace, Right? And if you're not in a city group, you can come and talk to me. It's, it's not the only place where you can display vulnerability, but if you're wondering where to get started, that's a good place. So third, we learn to rest in the gospel by delighting in God's past and present work. There is a special and unique joy that comes with being okay with who you are right now. And remember, that only the gospel will let you truly rest in who you are right now. Have you ever met a Christian who just believed, who is so vibrant, they believe the gospel so fully that they're just entirely comfortable in their own skin? Like it's, it's relatively rare, but I've, I've met people like that, and it's weird. <laughs> like, they're not trying to put on a front, or, you know, they, they are at peace with who God made them to be. They're at peace with what God is doing in them right now. As we learn to rest in the gospel, we get to celebrate the freedom that comes from having a secure identity in Jesus. The way the Apostle Paul put it is he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. So Christians are lifelong learners who continually grow resting in the gospel, or just continually rest in the gospel. Uh, flip over to Philippians chapter 4. That's the second passage we'll be looking at. Again, it'll be up on the screen uh, if you don't have it. The second part, the why not both, that we're trying to hold in tension is that Christians are lifelong learners who continually grow in godliness. So here's Philippians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So as Paul is closing his letter to the church in Philippi, he gives them one final word of instruction. 
continually grow in godliness. It's, it's their homework assignment, right? It, it's meant to be our kind of default action as believers. Look at verse 9. We see that, that same key word. It's actually the same word in Greek that Jesus used. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And I love that word, practice. There is so much freedom in that word, practice, because it really changes the way that we think about the Christian life. Has anybody ever told you to practice living as a Christian? Paul does. <laughs> Many of us accept God's grace for our justification, for, for that initial conversion, salvation, but when it comes to our struggle against the sin that remains in our hearts, when it comes to our sanctification, we sometimes operate like we need to do it perfectly, right? All right, I'm a Christian, here I go. And then you make a mistake and suddenly your faith just falls apart. But no, here's how it's supposed to work. We receive teaching, wisdom, understanding, and then we practice living like Jesus. We're not perfect at it. We try things out. We improve over time, we experiment and get better. And of course, everything we do is by God's grace. So, but, but sometimes we so heavily emphasize God's role in our growth that we don't actually take the words of the Bible seriously. Sometimes when it comes to the Christian life, we just put our hands up and it says, when, you know, when it comes to like being obedient and bearing fruit, Jesus take the wheel, right? You know, I don't need to do anything. And when we do that, we're not actually listening to the way that the biblical act, uh, authors are calling us to action. So Raquel, you are called, if you're a Christian, to practice growing in godliness. How? Fortunately, Paul gives us some suggestions in verse 8. Uh, I'll call these pathways for learning, right? Sources for instruction, uh, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, and so on, think on these things. And the basic principle is this, whatever is good and beautiful and true, in other words, everything that is from God in this world, that is the Christian's instruction manual for living like Jesus. That's our textbook, right? Sometimes I come across this idea in the church that anything made by Christians is instantly good and useful, and, and anything made by non-Christians is dangerous. You know, like, oh, be careful of learning anything from that person. They're not a believer. But Paul has a much, much broader view. He advocates the liberal arts approach to our moral education, right? You want to learn from just what's in the Christian bookstore? I want to learn from the whole library, from the whole world. For the mature believer, anything and everything good can teach us more about God, more about this world that he's made, more about how to live in it. Uh, Arthur Holmes, a philosophy professor at Wheaton College, used to say, all truth is God's truth. Here's an example. So one of my mentors uh, named Jerry uh, was returning from a trip, and, and Jerry told me that on the plane ride home, he watched a movie, an incredible, wonderful movie that he had never seen before. It was called The Notebook, you know, which is just about the sappiest romance movie that there is. And Jerry, you know, who's like a 60-year-old man, he's describing the scene where the wife with all Alzheimer's finally remembers her husband, right? And the two share just this, this brief moment of memory before her memory fades and she freaks out. And it reminded Jerry in that moment of how God's people forget the ones who loved them. And it broke his heart because he was looking in his own heart and he said, my own heart is prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. And so there's Jerry, this 60-year-old man who's been a Christian for about 40 years, weeping uncontrollably on a plane watching The Notebook because the Lord used that story to communicate truth to him, to reveal to him something true and lovely and stir in him a greater love for God. So, we can learn to grow in godliness through many different means, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, but the scriptures also give us a few unique avenues for learning, these special ways that the Lord has given us, has given to teach us to be more like him. They're sometimes called the means of grace or, or spiritual disciplines, and if you've been around Rock Hill for a little while, it's nothing surprising about these, you know, prayer, 
reading and meditating on the Bible, community with other believers, gathering for corporate worship, fasting, baptism and communion, and so on. And here's the interesting thing. The Bible doesn't prescribe just one way to do each of those things. So, so we even get to learn how to learn, right? We're going meta now. Uh, take reading the Bible. So I believe that reading the Bible is a necessary practice to grow in godliness because I believe that the Bible is God's perfect word, right? But how you read it and study it looks different for everyone, and, and you have to figure out the, the, the way that <laughs> works best for you. We have to learn from the Bible. We also need to learn how to learn from the Bible. Is it better for you to read in the morning or in the evening or in the afternoon? Print Bible, audio Bible, a, a dedicated reading plan, or, or just kind of going at your own pace? Will it help if you take notes and journal? Learn how you learn. Practice. Practice these things. This isn't denying the grace of God to save us. It's just obedience to the command to learn and grow in godliness. And, and I love this in Philippians 4. Look at verse 9. Just when we start to get overwhelmed by this, just when we begin to feel the slightest temptation to say, I need to learn how to be good so God will accept me, Paul puts in this little promise at the end of verse 9. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Put effort into learning how to follow and obey God, but never believe that you can accomplish anything without the ongoing, never-ending presence of the God of rest, the God of shalom, the God of perfection. That deeply comforting, because it means while I'm practicing and failing to live like Jesus, my master and my teacher is with me at all times. Paul gives us a, another example of his own, using his own life as an example of, of how to hold these two things in tension, resting in the gospel and growing in godliness. So if you glance down at verses 10 to 13, let me just read it as Paul gives his own life as an example here. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned, learned, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul is in a jail cell, which in those days was little more than a pit. He has been slandered, beaten, abused, mistreated, starved. And if we were in his sandals, it would be the worst day of our lives. And yet he tells the church in Philippi that the Lord has been using this situation to teach him. Look at verses 11 and 12. We, we see that word learn again. I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Now, there's this temptation. I don't know if you had this response. I had it for the longest time when I was reading this passage. Is that I, I would read about Paul learning these things, and I made it sound much more mystical than it actually is. Like, you know, Paul is sitting cross-legged and humming like, hmm, I have removed myself from all worldly concerns. No, the way that Paul learned was by viewing his situation as an opportunity for his teacher, Jesus, to instruct him. Uh, this is the school of hard knocks, right? This is the school of life. Paul felt hunger in his belly, that sharp pain. And he thought, oh, this is my homework from God. <laughs> I got to think about this. What is he trying to teach me? What do I need to practice? And he concluded, the only thing that will help me endure whatever comes my way is strength from God. That's the conclusion he came to. And that's what kept him going. That's what he learned and practiced. Paul's example is a model for you facing things in your own life. Whatever you encounter in your relationships, in your family, vocation, friendships, any other sphere of life, we have the privilege of being able to sit at the feet of Rabbi Jesus and ask, what are you teaching me? 
What are you teaching me? I don't see it right now, but I want to practice. I want to learn. A life that's continually asking that question, God, what are you teaching me right now? That is what it looks like to be a lifelong learner. So how can we learn to grow in godliness? Again, we'll look at the three words, declare, display, and delight. So first, we declare that we are God's work in progress. If you truly believe, if we truly believe as a church that we are saved by grace, then there should be no such thing as perfectionism in these walls. We should not expect that from ourselves or from anybody else. We're all learning. We're all practicing and messing up and trying by the grace of God to be better. And therefore, when we sin, our repentance is a declaration, not just that I need the cross, it's that I also need the Holy Spirit to transform me and change me. Learning changes the way that we apologize to one another, right? It's not just, I'm sorry I lost my temper, I need your forgiveness. It's also, I want to learn how to be more like Jesus when it comes to my anger, right? And if we're all doing that together, then this church can be a safe learning environment where we can say to each other, hey, I'm, I'm currently learning how to be more patient. I'm currently learning how to be more generous. What are you learning? In fact, that's a great question to ask a friend this week. What are you learning right now? Take some time to reflect on what God is teaching you right now. Second, display a practice of learning. So here's some ideas for how to build rhythms of lifelong learning. It's helpful to do an, a regular, honest self-assessment of your heart and your life. Maybe just an hour each month that you set aside and you pray, God, show me where I need to grow. <laughs> and then show me how to grow, because I have no idea. And then you make a plan with, with practical steps. If, if you're still lost, you can ask close friends and, and family members that uncomfortable question. And I bet you've never asked this to anybody. Where, how do you think I need to grow? <laughs> where am I weak? Where, where do I need to practice? And they usually do see things in your life more clearly than you do. Uh, consider what tools can help you grow in specific ways. So getting advice from, from a pastor or a wise counselor um, doing a personal study on a book of the Bible, reading a book with a friend and discussing it, changing a habit or a part of your schedule. Also, and this is a word to me as much as you, uh, whenever something new happens in your life, say you change jobs or move or have a baby, all of which have happened to me in the last six months, just <laughs> take a step back in that season when that transition period is going on. Take a step back and ask God for wisdom. Lord, what are you teaching me here? My life is a whirlwind and topsy-turvy. I need some steady ground. I need a plan to practice and grow. Finally, delight in the means of grace. There's this cheesy kids song I sang uh, in kids' church growing up. I don't know if they still sing it. You know, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll... Yeah, they don't sing it anymore. <laughs> and you'll grow, grow, grow. And... Uh, if I'm honest, I went through a phase as a Christian where I just prayed and I read the Bible, uh, not because I had joy in it, but because I felt that word should hanging over my head, you know, like a guillotine about to drop. And everything changed for me when I heard John Piper say something. This is what he said, I read the Bible every day for survival. I read it for survival because I need it. I can't do life on my own. We delight in water when we're in the desert and we find an oasis. We delight in the means of grace when we have a sense that I need this. I need to pray. I can't live life without prayer. I can't live life without community. I can't live life without the word of God. And let me get a little bit personal right now, family. I have a family talk. In the midst of the pandemic shutdown, most of us, and myself included, were kind of in emergency mode, and we, we just weren't growing in our faith very much. And I, and I get that, right? We were trying to keep everybody safe. We were trying to not lose our minds. But church, we can't stay in a place where we're not growing. We just can't. We, we can't stay in a place where we're just on autopilot with our faith, kind of using the pandemic as an excuse to not grow anymore. We, we need to learn. We need to grow. If you feel stuck in your walk with Jesus, 
if you feel like you're not growing, like you're not changing, like I'm exactly the same as I was two years ago, become a learner again. Start with the basic means of grace. Worship on Sunday morning. Start reading your Bible just a little bit more often than you do. Pray just a little bit more often than you do. Connect with other brothers and sisters. And, and here's a, a small plug I'll do. So if you don't know how to read the Bible, I don't want to assume that everybody in here just can pick up a Bible and just read it. Uh, I'm going to be teaching a three-week class on Wednesday nights in November on how to read and study the Bible. But all in all, practice these things. And the promise is the God of peace will be with you. Christians are lifelong learners We continually rest in the gospel. We grow in godliness. Let me pray for the Lord's help to do that. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that it gives us security in our identity in Jesus. Thank you that it gives us hope for all the broken things in our life that we wish were better. This week, would you teach us to rest, to rest our souls? Would you teach us to grow and practice, becoming more like you? Give us wise people around us, put truth in our paths. Be with us, Lord. God of peace, would you be with us? We pray this in the good name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to respond to the word of God by taking communion, which is one of, you know, view it as one of Jesus' object lessons for you, right? So if you are a Christian, the bread and the cup that you are holding are teaching you in a tangible way to remember Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Jesus said this in John chapter 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So that is the lesson that we are learning when we take communion. If you're not a Christian, if you're still learning about Jesus and, and you're about the salvation that he offers, then I would ask that you don't take communion and don't feel any shame about it. You're learning, right? And if you want to learn more, I'll be up here after the service. I'd love to talk to you more about Jesus, about the gospel. So if you want to come forward for communion, you can come up these center aisles uh, and then go around the sides. We also have contactless communion in the back there over by the coffee. So when you're ready to learn the lesson of the bread and the cup, then you can come forward. Turn to your seats. You can feel free to stand with us and continue singing. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, 
you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died praise the father praise the son praise the And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit.
God, you are the one holy God, holy, 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 the one worthy of our praise. And God, we just stand in awe of who you are. And God, when we think of your infiniteness, your bigness, your grandeur, God, may we never think we know what there is to know about you, but may we be constantly drawn in by your mercy, by your power, by your goodness, by your justice, that we might be people who are ever longing to learn more of who you are for the delight of our heart and for the transformation of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You can grab a real quick seat. Just got a couple announcements for you. First, like was mentioned, Gentle and Lowly. Dave Moe recommended this book to me. It made me cry. Um, yeah, God's heart for sinners, as we are so prone to try to earn our love from him. Um, just an incredible book. So grab that copy if you're interested. Second announcement, there's a foundations class or a new member class. That's going to be going on um, October 21st at 630 over at the church office. Uh, if you've been thinking about it, come in here for a while, become a member, join the family, learn the secret handshake. No, just kidding, that doesn't <laughs> But, And then finally, uh, last announcement for you, this is Pastor Appreciation Day. Um, we've got some green bins back in the room back there. They're going to be there the whole month of October. Um, yeah, just make that a priority to say thank you to our pastors, directors, and or their spouses. They love and serve us so well. It is not an easy calling. So if you would do that, um, I'm sure they would greatly appreciate it. So let's stand. So you guys are not uh, dismissed, but you are sent to display, declare, and delight in the gospel. Have a great week, everybody.